a little later, uh, I will give you an introduction into what the joint undertaking is and how we how we function. I think it's also very important that we are, if we start, who are we? Well, we are an, uh, an autonomous EU body. We've been set up uh, to, to um, for, for the specific purpose of HPC and quantum. Um, basically, we are, we are born out of the realization that there had been an underinvestment in Europe uh, in uh, supercomputer capacity. Uh, well, in supercomputers in general, so, uh, Europe had fallen behind, and uh, the 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 union uh, may, took a strategic initiative in trying to close that gap. And 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 essentially, what we do, uh, first of all, we are based in uh, we're based in Luxembourg, sunny Luxembourg, um, and uh, we are a we're a small team, but we of course work very closely with our colleagues in the commission. So we are, we are an autonomous entity. Uh, we, we implement our, our dedicated budget for this purpose, but we do that. The political agenda is driven uh, with the commission and our governing board. Uh, and, uh, and, we, and we implement within the specific area of, of HPC and quantum. Um, and I do have to point out that when it comes to AI, there's a whole unit within the commission that deals with the policy area of, of AI and, and, and things. So we are, of course, in collaboration with uh, with them on these things. At this point in time, we're 35 people in the JU, and we look to grow this to uh, about 50 people uh, by the end of the year. So equally, I would say if anyone's sitting out there thinking what we do is cool, uh, then uh, you are very welcome to visit our website on a regular basis. We are continuing to post job openings if the idea of uh, spending some years in Luxembourg, uh, if you find that intriguing. Um, I think the, the other important thing, we were created, we were set up autonomously in September 2020, so we have literally just uh, um, celebrated our three-year anniversary. So our mission, really, I touched on this already, um, we have in broad terms, we have three main missions. First of all, we were, we invest in uh, supercomputing and quantum computing infrastructure across Europe. Uh, and the way we do that is by, uh, by co-funding together with countries that wish to host a supercomputer, a, a, a machine uh, that will be uh, operated on behalf of EuroHPC. Uh, in, a, in a given country, and, and Vangelis will provide you a lot more information on the actual machines, and I'll get a little, I'll, I'll also give you a bit of an overview. Then parallel to that, it's not just about compute capacity, although that may be what you are all uh, interested in right now, but what we also do is we wish that Europe regains some capabilities uh, within the technology of, of regaining um, the ability to produce some of this uh, supercomputing equipment. So we are also we are also it, uh, put on this. Uh, put, uh, well, we've been created also to um, develop a, a a European supply chain or to strengthen the European supply chain. There is there is a, a supply chain, but we're looking to strengthen this. Um, a a good example of what we've done there is is. Uh, development of a European microprocessor, which has actually uh, resulted in the uh, company called Cyperl uh, that, is, uh, that is putting out a product now, and we hope to see it in future, in future supercomputers. And we're continuing this. Uh, we're embarking on RISC-5 uh, and, and other good stuff, and I'll also get a little more uh, into that. And then last but not least, what's the point of investing in all of this if, if no one knows how to use it? So we have a third important mission, which is to broaden the knowledge uh, and, and training education in uh, across the board in HPC uh, and, uh, and, and quantum. At this point in time, we have 33 participating countries, which is quite exciting because it's more than just the uh, usual European uh, member states. Uh, so it's quite, uh, it's quite an interesting group of uh, of members uh, that uh, come together in our governing board. We, of course, also have the union represented, uh, the commission, 
uh, and then we have three private members uh, that helps us with uh, our um, with our agenda. So basically, they uh, they help us with our strategic uh, agenda and uh, in in two advisory groups. All of these uh, all of these uh, parties get together in the governing board in our governing board, uh, where the decisions are taken on uh, on what we what we do. And uh, basically, to help the governing board, as I alluded to, we have two uh, advisory groups. We have the infrastructure advisory group and we have the research uh, and innovation advisory group. They each provide us uh, advice on, well, as the name suggests, one on how we should uh, we should evolve our infrastructure, and the other one on on what research and innovation in initiatives. Uh, we should be doing. And all of this comes together in what we call the multi-annual strategic plan, which is available on our website if anyone is, is uh, wishing to read it. The yeah. governing board then picks uh, the initiatives from, the, uh, from this plan uh, for the annual work program. And one of the things that's currently ongoing, we have an upcoming governing board uh, in the beginning of October. Um, and again, as I said, AI has become a, an important topic, and I cannot unfortunately disclose what we're going to discuss because that is going to be for, for the governing board. Uh, to. I can't prejudge the outcome, but I can tell you that AI is getting increasingly important on our agenda, and I would be astonished if you will not see some significant AI initiatives as part of Work Programme 24. Daniel will already, uh, in a later point, tell you about uh, what we are already doing within Work Program 23 uh, to help, especially SMEs in, in, in AI. As I said, we are an autonomous body uh, and we've been entrusted with union funds. Uh, so uh, if you look at this, these are incredible numbers. We, in our regulation, we've been entrusted with uh, almost 2 billion euros to build infrastructure across Europe. This is infrastructure in supercomputing. It is also infrastructure in, uh, in quantum computers. Then we've been entrusted with 900 million for our research uh, and innovation agenda. In this, we fund things like uh, processor development, but also applications development, um, and, and the, uh, basically what we call the full stack. And then last but not least, we've been entrusted with 200 million euros in, from what's called the Connected Europe facilities. These, this money will be used to um, improve the connectivity. Uh, basically, we're looking to hyper-connect, high-speed connectivity between all of our Euro HPC machines. And this is in its making at the moment. Back to the supercomputers, Vangelis will give you a lot more insight into, into this, but, uh, but just to say, at this point in time, we have seven operational computers all of these machines are available to you guys to use, uh, and I do need to I do need to stress that they are available uh, for for use for scientists across Europe. Uh, we have Vega in Slovenia, Karolina, Czech Republic, Discover in Bulgaria, Malexina here in Luxembourg, Lumi, which is currently number three in the world, uh, the third largest machine in in. Uh, in uh, the world and number one in Europe, located in Finland, Leonardo in Italy, uh, and then which is number four, by the way, and number two in Europe, and then Decalion in Portugal. On the way, we have uh, Marinostrum 5, uh, which is uh, which is which will be available later this year in Spain. And then we are just about to embark on, uh, on the, Europe's first exascale machine. I hope to sign the contract for that this week. Uh, and we will be building uh, Europe's first exascale machine, and it will be hosted uh, by Jülich Supercomputing Center in Germany. And then, uh, last but not least, we have uh, uh, Pedalias, which is coming up in Greece. Um, I think it, it, I alluded to the budget on the previous slide. What is important to say is every time the joint undertaking spends a euro, someone else spends a euro. This is the idea of joint undertaking. So when uh, we have these machines, uh, basically they have been co-funded uh, by the joint undertaking and 
the uh, participating states. Uh, in some sort, in some cases, there's a consortium of participating states that is funding the other part of the machine. If we take Lumi, uh, it is funded 50-50, which means the joint undertaking uh, uh, has paid 50% of the machine, and there's a consortium of no less than 10 countries uh, that of, that is funding the other uh, part of the machine. When we co-fund the machines, basically we share the access time uh, in the same in the same manner. So again, if we look at Lumi, the joint undertaking uh, manages controls 50% of the compute time of Lumi. The consortium that has paid the other 50% uh, controls the other 50%. What we're going to be talking about today is access to the 50% that uh, that the joint undertaking owns. Uh, and uh, Clara will later go into details about how you can all apply for this. So when we invest in these machines, we invest in them in order to make the access available to uh, users in Europe. Just to uh, so you can see, none of these machines are small. Whilst uh, whilst Lumia and Leonardo, of course, are the biggest, uh, all of these machines are very credible machines on on the top 500. Many of them are equipped with uh, with GPUs that would make them uh, that would make them very suitable for AI. And as I already alluded to, uh, we are just in the final stages of uh, starting the. Uh, starting to construct the uh, Europe's first exascale machine. This is where we're going to go for a billion billion calculations a second. It will be uh, hosted in Germany um, by the Jülich Supercomputing Center. And again, once available, 50% of the access time to this machine will be made available uh, to uh, to anyone out there that fulfills the uh, eligibility criteria. On the quantum side, it's not just about supercomputers uh, in in, uh, in your HPC, although that's probably what you're all most in, interested in today. But we are doing what we've been doing for supercomputing. We were also entrusted in the new regulation to do for quantum computing. So we have launched an initiative that will result in six uh, quantum computers being made available to uh, users across Europe, and it will be in exactly the same way uh, as for the uh, HPC systems. 50% of the access time will be available to anyone uh, that fulfills the criteria. And it's very important to say you don't need just you don't need to have a quantum computer in your country to be able to access it. This is open via the JU to anyone uh, within uh, within the, uh, that fulfills the criteria, which for the for our supercomputers is is countries within Horizon 2020. Um, just some stats on what we've already managed to award. Uh, I'm not going to dwell a lot into it, but close to two billion uh, hours on core hours on our systems have already been awarded to science in a very in various areas. Uh, and uh, Clara will give you um, details on how this works. This is something we are looking also to make. Uh, which is easier for uh, for AI. There, there's already a lot of AI projects that have uh, gotten in there, but we are looking to make the uh, process maybe a, a, a little easier. Um, it's not as hard as it sometimes gets uh, gets um, <laughs> that we that people as people think. I think uh, at the end of the day, we we've, we've uh, taken inspiration from Praise, who's been doing this for years. Uh, and um, and if you're familiar with that process, you would also be very familiar with how to apply for access time uh, on your HPC systems. Just very quickly on the, on the, our research agenda, which Daniel will talk to. Uh, basically, we look to invest in what we call the full stack. We start at the hardware level, where we are investing in things like low power processors and accelerators. Then a, a software stack, which is a in about fundamental algorithms and software that, that goes on to the HPC system. Next here, of course, are the actual applications where we're doing quite a bit of investment. This is an area where Europe has traditionally been very strong and we wish to make sure we continue to be leading. And then finally, the users. Uh, this, is, this is really something we wish to, uh, we really want to make sure that as many, uh, as many people in 
Europe is able to take advantage of, of HPC. And with that, I'm going to finish here. Uh, the, the, the next presenters will go in, into a lot more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anders, for your presentation. And again, the slides uh, will be available and you're welcome to ask your questions in the chat. And with that, I will pass the floor to the next speaker, who is the head of infrastructure sector at EuroHPC JU, um, Vangelis Floros. And Vangelis will talk about opportunities on EuroHPC systems for AI research. So, yeah, thank Vangelis. You, I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> We hear you and, and you're I'm welcome. I'm sharing now my PowerPoint. Yeah, we see. Okay, good. Uh, so good morning all also from my side. I mean, it's uh, really uh, great to see so many people joining this uh, event this morning. So as Lilith mentioned, I am uh, heading the um, infrastructure sector group here in, uh, in, uh, in the JU. And the focus of this presentation will be on our supercomputers. Uh, what are the um, some technical details about their architecture that may be interested for you to, to understand what we are offering in terms of resources and some uh, first ideas about uh, how to get access and some practical considerations when accessing our system. So our supercomputers is really um, it's uh, really one of the core activities of the GU, as Anders mentioned. There is a significant budget being uh, spent and uh, an infrastructure being deployed across Europe. The purpose of this infrastructure is to empower scientific research, uh, be it in, in academia, in uh, research centers, in industry, for SMEs. And our, our goal is to provide the necessary power uh, and needed nowadays really to to, to, to progress science, to, to progress uh, discovery in, in all the sectors uh, of, of you know, research and, and, and industry. My team is responsible mainly for uh, procurements of systems. So we are running the, the procurements. We are overviewing the deployment installation and then we monitor on a high level, the operation of uh, the systems, as well uh, upgrades of, of existing systems. Then uh, a part of my team is responsible to implement the peer review process, the access uh, policy that uh, through which end users uh, have the opportunity to access and use the systems. And we are also working on various other activities related to infrastructure development. Uh, one of them is uh, connectivity, uh, moving towards to hyper-connected uh, HPC systems to, you know, to enable um, tighter integration and uh, to enable the uh, applications that require you know, bulk access, bulk transfers to, to systems, quick access, uh, execution of complex workflow among different systems. Uh, also towards that, there is the uh, this activity of federation, how to combine all the systems together on a high level services. And also we are overviewing the high level support teams, the application support teams that they help end users uh, to, to, to port applications, to optimize their applications in this infrastructure. I will focus on what is available right now and not so much what is coming in the future. Um, so this is the, the situation at, at the moment that, that we speak. These are the systems that we have deployed across Europe. As Anders mentioned, right now there are eight supercomputers uh, that are either owned or co-owned by EuroHPC. So the, we have the pre-access scale systems that we own them. Uh, these are systems that um, we we have procured. We will we led the procurement process, and uh, we are uh, funding 50% of acquisition and 50% of the operation cost for five years. These are uh, Lum in Finland, Leonardo in Italy, and Mare Nostrum Five in uh, Spain. Uh, along with this, we had uh, we have smaller systems uh, on the petascale level, um, for which we have co-funded. Most of them uh, have been procured under the uh, the responsibility of the local uh, hosting entities, 
and for which we cover only 35% of the acquisition costs. Now, we, as we are co-funding these systems, we don't have access, we don't owe 100% of the of the access time to the systems. For the pre access scale, we, we can use 50% of the resources of the access time, essentially. And for the beta scale, in analogy, we can use 35%. Uh, of, uh, of access time. Now, all these systems are not operated by the GU, of course, or they are operated by uh, experienced supercomputing centers. We call them hosting entities. Uh, these supercomputing centers at some point uh, applied to uh, they respond to a, to a call for expression of interest uh, to host the UHPC system. They pass through an evaluation process. Uh, we have signed uh, agreements with this defining a several uh, level of uh, service level uh, requirements and we work together now uh, in order to offer and to operate this infrastructure. I will go into details how these systems look like and what they offer in terms of hardware and uh, architectures. So I will start with our flagship systems, the pre scale systems that we, as I said, USB is, is the owner. Uh, we have Lumi, uh, which is installed in Kajani, Finland, and so uh, operated by CSC. CSC is leading a consortium of many countries that have contributed uh, from their side with national funding to acquire the system, to co-fund the system. Uh, this is a Cray EX system that uh, is being built by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Right now is number three in the, in the world uh, with a sustained performance, link pack performance of 309.1 petaflops, which has been uh, measured in the GPU partition, the Lumi G partition, as we call it. So as you see the numbers, it's it's, uh, it's quite a big system, thousands of nodes, uh, two big partitions, one with uh, GPUs and one with uh, CPUs only. Uh, the architecture is based on uh, AMD, uh, CPUs and GPUs, AMD EPIC, and AMD Instinct MI250X GPUs. Uh, overall, we all this offers more no, 11,712 GPUs AMD. Uh, nodes connected with a slingshot interconnect, which is the high performance low latency interconnect developed by Cray. Uh, 117 uh, petabytes of storage. Uh, all, all these systems have uh, different layers of storage, different with different capacity and capabilities. Fast storage with uh, NVMEs, uh, more uh, uh, bulk storage with uh, based on hard disks. Uh, all, and the numbers I'm presenting here is the, the aggregated numbers. So this is the overall storage available. Um, and then if we move to Leonardo, this is the system uh, that uh, is installed in Bologna, in Italy, and is uh, operated by Cineca. Uh, this is based on NATO's Bulsiguana XH2000 architecture. Now, right now it's number four in the world uh, with 238.7 petaflops performance in the GPU partition, which is called the Leonardo booster. Again, quite a large number um, comparable to, to the size of uh, Lumi. Uh, slightly more GPUs, which are based on NVIDIA A100. Uh, again, very fast interconnect, quite rare really infinite HDR200, 110 petabytes of luster storage. And the architecture, as I said, is GPUs uh, based on, on custom Aber A100. This is a version of A100 specifically developed for Leonardo. And on the CPU side, we have Intel Sapphire Rapids 56 core on the CPU partition and 32 core in the GPU partition. Now, our latest addition is uh, the Mario Nostrum 5 system, uh, which is in the last stages of installation. We are expected to be operational soon. This picture that you see, you see it's, it's a kind of a bootleg picture. I took it uh, this, uh, this June when I visited Mario Nostrum 5. Uh, so this has not been uh, put in operation yet. It's not inaugurated, but as you can see, all, most of the system is already on floor and we are in the stages of fine tuning and of fixing various smaller or bigger issues. 
In any case, this is really, in, in terms of capacity, the, the biggest system that we have. You see the number of nodes, almost 1,500 nodes. Uh, it offers one of the biggest uh, CPU-only partitions in the world. It will be a 35 petaflop CPU-only uh, partition with almost 6,500 uh, nodes. Um, in, in terms of GPUs, uh, it's, it's a smaller partition we're comparing to Lumi or Leonardo, but these are based on the latest version of uh, NVIDIA H100. Uh, which offer compared to A100 at least two times uh, the performance. So it's uh, it's really a formidable um, you know, system and really uh, for for applications uh, utilizing GPUs, it's really going to be an excellent platform. Again, here uh, high speed, low latency interconnect, quad rail infinibud. Uh, Quad large storage, 250 petabytes, based on the IBM GPFS system. This is an Intel NVIDIA platform, similar to, to Leonardo, but uh, on, on latest version. Again, Intel Safi Rapid CPUs, NVIDIA Hopper GPUs. And overall, this is a system based on the uh, Bullsequan Atos architecture, the latest version, one uh, generation uh, latest than Leonardo, the H XH3000. This is the, the GPU partition, and the CPU only partition is uh, Lenovo Thing Systems architecture. Um, so the the performance for Mario Nostrum 5 has not been uh, uh, measured yet. We are about to to run Linback on on both partitions and submit the results for the November top 500 list. So you will hear news about this soon. Then if we move to our smaller systems, um, so uh, these are the five petascale systems offering, as you can see, uh, performance between uh, 5 to 12 petaflops. Now, these are smaller systems, however, they do offer a significant amount of resources and they provide an excellent stepping stone for applications that they want to, to enter you know, uh, supercomputing uh, environments, uh, do some initial runs before maybe moving to the bigger systems. So here we have uh, Viga in Slovenia, Meluxina in Luxembourg, Carolina in Czech Republic, Discovery in Bulgaria, and our very latest addition, a uh, system that was just inaugurated and will be put on operation in November. This is Ducalion system in, uh, in uh, Portugal. Now, as you can see from the characteristics, most of the systems rely on uh, AMD Epic ROM CPUs, and they offer uh, NVIDIA A100 GPUs. Uh, the only system right now that doesn't have a GPU partition is Discover in Bulgaria. However, this system is currently under uh, upgrade and we will be going to soon add uh, GPU partition also to this system. Um, uh, and uh, in uh, uh, Ducalion is one of the systems that differentiate from the others. As you can see, uh, it uh, incorporates uh, one big uh, ARM partition with uh, Fujitsu ARM A64FX CPUs, which are similar with, with what is offered in, uh, in Fugaku in uh, Japan. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it will be a, a, an interesting system in terms that it, it offers this uh, ARM architecture and uh, many of our activities uh, for developing you know, European CPUs have focused uh, and they are exploiting ARM architecture. So uh, this will be also an, an interesting stepping stone for upcoming systems that will be utilizing European processors based on ARM. Uh, if we put all these systems together and uh, we combine all the numbers, all the, the, the resources offered. You see uh, even also the PETA scales is a considerable amount of resources uh, in terms of different partitions, CPU, GPUs, and storage. And all of them offer some form of visualization, cloud capabilities, 
uh, containers, and there is even an FPGA partition in Maluxina available for, for public access. Now, I will not mention many things about the future, what's coming, but only maybe focus on uh, the Jupyter Exascale system, which uh, will be uh, the big news coming the next uh, days, as Anders mentioned. So this will be our first Exaflop uh, system, uh, which will be installed in uh, Ulix Supercomputing Center in Germany. This will be based on a modular architecture, uh, so which combines different partitions with different architectures, uh, offered to applications uh, over uh, a, a unifying layer of software that allows applications you know, to exploit dynamically in different partitions based on their requirements. Um, the Exaflow performance will be offered by the booster partition, which will contain uh, GPUs. And this will be hosted in a containerized data center in Ulic. Uh, it's in terms of budget, it's, it's one of the no, most expensive, most high budgeted systems uh, that we have procured with a total budget of 273 million euros for acquisition and support maintenance. And the timeline, as uh, you can see, uh, right now we are in the status of co contract signature. Beginning of installation is foreseen for uh, beginning of uh, next year, and we are aiming for a link pack test, first link pack and running of the booster partition uh, by the end of next year. This be this time to have the, uh, this partition on the floor and to be able to run Linbuck and soon after to, to put in acceptance phase and to offer it for production purposes. Um, now moving to the important question of how you get access to our uh, supercomputers. Um, so uh, we will go into more details. Clara will present the exact process. However, the key concepts here is that access is for free and open to all uh, entities that they are affiliated in uh, within Europe. Now, when I say within Europe, I mean uh, first of all, member states, EU member states. Uh, and participating states that they are also members of uh, the joint undertaking, but also any other country that uh, is uh, affiliated, is associated with the uh, European funding program. And the, the key question here, when you consider getting the access, is uh, which program has funded these systems? So all the systems that you saw were funded by Horizon 2020. So if the, the, the country uh, you are affiliated, you are residing, your company or your, um, or your research center is located within uh, a country that has participated in Horizon 2020, uh, then you are eligible for access. Now, uh, systems are open for uh, academic research institutions, public sector, in industrial enterprises, SMEs, um, and um, the, the the only requirement that uh, we 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 ask is uh, uh, that uh, this these the systems are used for research and innovation purposes for open science, and whenever you you produce results, you publish them and you acknowledge uh, that it was. You know, UHPC that provide the resources based on the EU funding. And also to help us with you know, dissemination, publication activities, uh, with uh, work coming out from, uh, from these systems. Uh, we offer various different ways to access them. <clears throat> and the key uh, point here is the access policy. This is the document that defines uh, the processes, roles, and different access modes that you can use uh, to request access to the systems. In principle, you need to, to submit a proposal, you need to, to submit a, a request describing uh, the, your application, why you need access for, how many resources, uh, for which amount of time, and then there is a different process depending on which access mode you have uh, chosen. Uh, in, in broadly speaking, there are four different access modes. 
uh, extreme scale and regular access, which offer a large amount of resources. And these are processes that uh, applications go through a peer review process. Uh, here, there's a separate track for industry and the public sectors. So uh, the applications are evaluated with different criteria comparing to traditional scientific applications. So this, uh, these access modes, the evaluation process takes some time, uh, usually from four to six months. Um, but if you need quick access, but with smaller resources, there are two more opportunities, the development access modes, which can give you access for up to one year. Uh, and this is, as the name mentions, aimed for uh, development of codes, uh, some uh, small benchmarking, uh, you know, testing of, of capabilities. And then if you really only f want to focus on benchmarking, which, uh, which is a prerequisite when you submit uh, an application for the extreme scale or the regular access, then you can use the, the benchmark modes, which offers a small amount of resources for three months. Now, the, what is important for the development and benchmark access is that the, uh, the allocations are very quick. Um, every end of the month, there is a cut of dates that we collect or collect the applications. We pass it through some administrative checks to, to, to check the eligibility of the request. Then uh, a technical assessment from the Super Community Center from the hosting entity for which you have requested resources to, to assess the applicability of the code to run in a specific system, in a specific architecture, and then very quickly, within two weeks, usually you get a, a response and you start getting access to the system. There are some other opportunities. Uh, there is a possibility for uh, commercial access using a paper use model, uh, for which, of course, you just pay and you don't need to, uh, to go through any uh, evaluation peer review process. Uh, however, there the situation right now is that actually the GU does not sell resources. If you have a request to to, to access and to pay for resources, we will direct you to hosting entities that uh, provide right now uh, co commercial access possibilities. One important thing that I want to mention right now is that uh, Praise has been supporting uh, UHPC for the implementation of the access policy uh, for the last two years. That's why when you uh, visit the websites uh, and the, the, the system, uh, the portal that you submit applications, you will see that it's operated by Praise. But we, we warned that this uh, operated by, by praise on uh, on behalf of UHPC and the, the team that is responsible for the allocation for running all the evaluation is uh, the JU itself. Uh, if I, I want to mention some practical considerations when you are applying, especially for applications coming from AI, because this these systems have been built with uh, traditional computational sciences in mind. Uh, we do believe, I do believe personally, that uh, they are, uh, provide excellent uh, platform for AI applications. I mean, you saw the technologies behind it, all the, the GPU architectures, the, the, the high performance uh, network behind them. Uh, they are they are excellent platforms, but you need to to consider some things when you uh, access these systems. First of all, uh, as I mentioned, access is provided for a, a specific period of time, prefixed once, usually one year. Uh, and the purpose is uh, to, to to do some research, to run experiments, or in case of AI, uh, to 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 run some big model training uh, jobs. And then once you have the results, uh, take the, the, the data away and you know continue with any inference related task activities, applications uh, in other uh, in other systems. Um, it's it's important to have this, the codes tested uh, and to confirm that they can run in our systems. So that's why I direct you to, to consider benchmark development calls. Uh, these systems are not for production use. Uh, you can, uh, as I mentioned, the, the idea of model training for inference runs. You may have may do some inference runs. Uh, however, this will be in the in context of other experiments when these inference runs may be uh, uh, related to other scientific activities. 
Um, keep in mind that this is a multi-tenancy environment. Usually, uh, you you form these your your applications as jobs that you submit on a queuing system. That then it has to wait and has to. Uh, to, to compete with other jobs in order to, to take priority to run. This means that if you have really large allocations, if you are looking for thousands of GPUs, for example, this may take some time. Also, these, uh, these jobs are running for a limited amount of time, then need to be restarted. So this means that you need to implement some snapshotting functionality. And then when it comes to big data requirements, although these systems both offer large, large storages and uh, very fast connectivity to the Xi'an network, if if you have requirements really to, to transmit large amount of data, tens of petabytes, you need to, to coordinate first with a hosting entity uh, in order you know, to coordinate the, the transfers and the, the allocation of storage. And as I mentioned, uh, we, we don't provide long-term storage. The idea is that you will move your data around your application, and then the results, you have to take them out to a different system. And I will finish uh, with one important aspect of application support. Uh, we know application support is very important, especially for uh, non-experienced uh, communities. And um, we we recently launched a call, and uh, we have a, a awards a grant for a project that will start in February, with a, with a purpose uh, exactly to provide application support to European users in terms of application enabling, code scaling, and offering pre best practices guidelines, training uh, with specific consideration to AI applications. Um, yes, so this will start in uh, in February. It will be led by CSC, and essentially all the hosting entities are participating on this, and we will offer resources and their expertise. And with that, uh, running a bit out of time, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much, Vangelis. Indeed, we are running out of time, about 15 minutes, but nevertheless, the question answer session is extremely important. And I think we can start with you now, as we got some questions in the chat. So the first one was, uh, now that the UK is back in Horizon, will UK users be able to use Euro HPC systems? And to be honest, I gave already part of the answer, saying that we have already UK researchers running projects on all the systems that are online now. Uh, but maybe you can uh, detail a bit more on this. Right. So, I mean, as I mentioned, the, the, the existing systems have been acquired with H 2020 funding, and UK was part of Horizon 2020. So, UK entities can access our systems, can use our systems openly. Uh, now that the new systems that are coming are funded by Digital Europe program, my understanding is that also a country affiliated with Horizon Europe will be eligible to access uh, debt funded systems or, or any kind of other resource. Uh, there, however, we need to, to clarify a bit because what I have seen, there are some limitations when the, the funding took place, when UK joined uh, Horizon Europe. Uh, we will clarify this is when we will inform the community. Okay, thank you. The other question from the same uh, guest is, will we see the UK host the Euro HPC system? Um, so, I mean, uh, the, the requirement in order to become hosting entity is to be member states and to be a participating states of, of your HPC. So, right now, this possibility uh, is not viable, but you know, we never know about the future. Okay, thank you. And the third question is the access policy that we have also applied to the hosting entity part of the resources. No, uh, it's hosting entity, the national part, the co-funded part is governed by the national access policy, so they have different ways to, to manage the access time uh, with, uh, you know, different priorities and different eligibility criteria. Uh, what I also missed uh, to mention is that this access policy is two years old, is a bit outdated if you go search for it in the, in our in our data in our website uh, we are currently going through uh, overhaul the revision of the access policy which 
going to to cater a lot for uh, current uh, AI requirements of uh, European communities. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? You are welcome to raise your hand and ask. Yes, we see one in the chat. We see many in the chat. Okay, I'm reading. The eligibility is for EU entities, but the people that need to access can be out of the eligible countries and not be EU. Um, so, uh, as I said, in, in general, it's the affiliation that is important where you are based. Uh, so far, our policy is that if um, I mean, there is a proposal with collaborators outside of um, eligible countries, these collaborators cannot have account on our system, so they cannot get direct access to our systems. Uh, he clarifies a bit more. Uh, he means EU entities apply, but the collaborators are out of EU. Yes, so this, these people cannot have an account on the system. OK, thank you. And then finally, a, a question from NCC Montenegro about the slides. And yes, the slides and the recording will be available on our website. And you're always welcome to link from your National Competence Center to, to our websites and to our events. Anders, I see a hand from you. I uh, just uh, to avoid confusion, I mean, when we talk about EU there for access, we're not talking about member states, we're talking about who is associated with the program. So it, it, users outside of EU member states can have accounts on our system. I think it's a bit confusing and we need to uh, draft a bit clear with the countries. Yes, yeah, politics are confusing. Anyways, thank you very much. So we're running out of time. We're almost 30 past and uh, but it's good to have a short break. So I would suggest to have a five minutes break and uh, continue at 35 past 10. So see you at 10 past 35 minutes.
Uh, it works. You just need the whole screen. Okay. Well, then it's 35 past 10 and let's continue with our program. And the next is the series of success stories that we would like to present you. And these are the projects that have been running successfully on our machines. And the first speaker is Tomislav Sturga, a head of TIS AI uh, department from Croatia. So Tomislav, the floor is yours. You are welcome to share and... Mm, hello, hello, hello. Uh... Do you see my screen? Perfect, thank you. OK. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our uh, project slash product. Now it's a product, send. Uh, Amislav, you went muted. Can you, can you unmute? Um, yes. Okay. Yes, now fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to present our uh, product. And uh, I'm Tom Stostergar, head of TCI department uh, here in this group, um, uh, this group in Croatia. Uh, now uh, I will tell a few words about this group. Uh, this group is a uh, company, I, uh, ICT company established 30 years ago and uh, have a headquarter in Croatia with the two, uh, two subsidiaries in uh, Slovenia and uh, UK. Uh, in this group of work, uh, you are working more than uh, 120 uh, certified experts, uh, uh, experts in different uh, ICT fields, business analysis, project management, AI, uh, IT development and so on. We are also developing project uh, worldwide. Um, also, we have a lot of uh, partnership with the major vendors in the world. OK, uh, SEND, what is SEND? SEND is an uh, acronym for System for uh, System for Early Neurological Deviation Detection uh, with the main objective to de develop AI system that can automatically assess the quality of general movements in infant. So, a um, few words about the medical perspective of uh, this project. Uh, we, everything is based on a method that is established 30 years ago. Um, that, that is simple, early, early available, not invasive, safe. Uh, doctors and uh, uh, trained professionals need only to watch the movements of uh, infant. It's evidence proven method. Uh, so um, when you watch your child uh, uh, with fidgety movements, when uh, they are uh, do doing the movements, uh, their brain is learning. So uh, during that movements, uh, to apply this method, general movement assessment, uh, we need to watch uh, all parts of body to our assessment. These movements need to have complexity, uh, need to be fluent, uh, some backs and vein intensity, and all movements have a beginning, uh, had gradual beginning and the end. Some uh, some um, doctors and certified professional uh, said that uh, those movements uh, has uh, some number of uh, frequency. Uh, so uh, this project SEND is uh, co-financed by European funds for innovation, research and uh, development. Uh, we started uh, more than uh, 2000 in August 2020. Uh, the project was divided in two phases, research and development. Our target public, as I said, are uh, our children in uh, early infancy, between two and three months, uh, when they are just two or th between two and three months, in, because those uh, fidgety movements are uh, uh, the, the best movements are in that periods. So we are trying to detect the some disorders in that period of time that can pre, uh, that can uh, uh, detect and prevent some uh, some uh, uh, some normal 
uh, expect a normal outcome in a group of narrow risk children. So I will talk some and I will share with you some research and development challenges that we are faced with during our project. Our main uh, problem and challenge was how to gather a representative data set of fidgety movements. There is no, there was no possibility to, to do some synthetic data set. So we needed to have a, a real data set, real readers of movements. So our project was uh, and, and was and is still open for public, for our people worldwide. Uh, that uh, wants to share uh, with us of fidgety moments of their parents, of their ch uh, children, sorry. Uh, and then as a feedback, they come, they, uh, they, they got the report uh, with the results of assessment. All assessment is done uh, during a project by, uh, was done by uh, two neuropediatricians, minimum two pediatricians, and based on those results, we train our neural networks models to, to predict the same results as uh, our uh, doctor. So uh, during the, that period of time and now we are trying to increase the awareness to why fidgety movements are so important. Uh, so we have a lot of media, media, media and uh, uh, different media and conference uh, presentations about this. So because of um, managing a lot of videos and because of wanted to uh, in, uh, increase the um, the user experience. We developed uh, Send web application that is available on uh, send.eu. Also, uh, that web application is used by uh, parents, assistants, doctors, and uh, AI researchers. Also, we developed uh, mobile applications uh, for Android and iOS for parents to increase the, the as I said, the user experience to uh, avoid some uh, bad, uh, accepting a bad videos um, uh, with the video. This this um, this mobile app is still free, but not for uh, I think um, maybe a few more weeks. So if you want, if you have children, please go and see. Uh, also, um, some other challenges was uh, from AI perspective uh, was some uh, how to to do video pose estimation. Uh, we decided to to detect uh, to use some um, existing uh, model models, but those models was not trained for. Uh, uh, for uh, on adults, just uh, was trained on adults, not for babies. So we decided to to do some annotations to detect 15 key points on infant's body, three per limbs plus eyes and nose. So uh, also we decided to to develop our own application uh, in Python for annotation. Uh, some other challenges was how to use those mathematical model of uh, um, of movements in other in other neural network model, uh, so we tested several outputs type. Uh, we used uh, output uh, general uh, videos uh, with outputs with the annotation. Uh, also, we generate from those movements from th those data from JSON file uh, heat map. Heat map is just visual representation of uh, movement of, of key, key points on each frame. So we use uh, composite heat maps, uh, tried with composite with heat maps, tried to uh, separate it heat maps uh, with a um, uh, single heat map or like light wrist, left ankle, uh, and so and right ankle, and so on. Uh, but the, the best results uh, that we got. Uh, was after we after we tested and researched more than 25 uh, different uh, different uh, neural network models, algorithms, and so on. The best results we got uh, are with uh, different types of uh, architecture of uh, con uh, convolution neural networks, KNN, SVM, and logistic regression. Some other statistical information that I can share with you that we uh, on some. Uh, AI data provider uh, providers, uh, their infrastructure was used um, more than in one iteration of training. We uh, was um, uh, training was lasting more than all, almost 21 day, so it was very 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 uh, long. So this was the reason why we decided to to search is there any other possibilities, and that was the reason how we got to uh, how we find the uh, Euro HPS. Uh, 
till now, till uh, yesterday, uh, we have more. We have more than 1,040 uh, videos with of general movements from uh, different uh, countries of European Union, USA, and so on. So the current results, uh, the latest results uh, in, uh, are, are, are those uh, in training and validation set. We used more than fi almost 500 videos, uh, valid videos that are, that are watched and classified by our uh, neuropediatricians. Uh, those uh, 500 videos are from uh, almost 200 uh, children. And in testing set, um, testing set we have uh, 150 videos from almost uh, 400, uh, for, um, 40, 40 uh, children. Uh, the current results, as you can see, uh, from uh, for logistic regression, Canon and convolution network, are pretty pretty uh, good because, um, uh, as you can see. Our own models and algorithms. Our approach was to uh, avoid the possibility to miss the or to give a wrong uh, wrong assessment for 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 videos or for patients that has uh, all some potential problems or deviations or disorders. So our model was trained with that uh, with that approach. Uh, as the proof of that, you can see that uh, one category in results uh, negative predictive value is uh, very high. Uh, so the the reason is very high, as I explained in early sentence. Uh, so as a conclusion, uh, this this product is not. Uh, I need to uh, uh, I need to say. Oh, uh, it's not self-diagnostic tool. It can uh, it can act as automated screening tool that will save a time to and human resource for doctors. It can uh, be a, uh, it can act as a second opinion in any institution if there is no two uh, certified professional for this method or um, or is there or or uh, is there no any uh, second neuropediatrician or. Uh, this method can be this product can be used in prevention to avoid unnecessary stress for our children to go on some uh, stress uh, some invasive uh, method if there is some any potential uh, disorders uh, so we need we know uh, we want to uh, detect uh, some disorders in early infancy as much as as um, uh, early as we can uh, our main approach, as I said, was not to miss infants with abnormal general movements, and uh, send can be offered. Is uh, send offering is for B to C, so it means that every parents worldwide can uh, can uh, go on our site or download our web uh, our web application and be one of uh, our uh, customer. Uh, for now, as I said, a uh, few more weeks is everything is still free because everything is free was because we was co-financed by European Union still uh, August uh, 2023. So uh, nothing uh, was uh, uh, some any commercial uh, was not allowed. Now we are uh, those kind of commercial phase so we can um, uh, uh, go in a commerce commercialization uh, phase. Also, with this offer can be uh, good for any hospital, any type of uh, pediatric uh, pediatric uh, polyclinic or other polyclinic that can uh, that are uh, that this send can be offered as a additional value to additional offer to to do their uh, patient. So, send this team is uh, uh, send team is this group and uh, first pediatric polyclinic uh, Dr. Sabol. So, this is our conclusion. Okay, thank you very if there much. Is any question? There are questions in the chat, so if you can answer them, that would be great. And I guess you used Meluxina system, your HPC uh, uh, system. Uh, uh, no, uh, Vega. Vega. Uh, H yes. HPS okay. Vega in Marburg. Okay, in Slovenia. Uh, Thank you. Yes. But yeah. we then may uh, may ask you to stop sharing so that we okay. continue with okay. the presentation. And meanwhile, okay. you are welcome to answer in the chat the questions. Can you calculate the cost? Can, uh, okay. Can, I will. Yeah, sorry? just type in the chat your the okay. answers. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Bye.
And then we go on with our second presentation of the success stories, which is Robin Kurtz, a data scientist from KB Labs, the National Library of Sweden. And uh, Robin, I see now your slides. No, I don't see. I, I see now. I, I see now the um, teams. I hope now you see the slides. Yeah, now I see the slides. Um, can I also? Wait. No. Do you still see the slides? Yes, in presenter mode. Perfect. Uh, so I'm going to talk about our project, uh, Large Language Models for Swedish. And uh, I'm Robin Kurz from the National Library of Sweden, uh, more precisely KB Lab. This is the National, National Library of Sweden, the, the main building in Stockholm, which is a beautiful building in a beautiful park. So if you're in Stockholm, go visit. And the National Library of Sweden uh, is in Sweden at least known as Kungliga Biblioteket. So why is it translated as National Library, not Royal Library? Well, that's sort of the the um, the um, the old name, um, but the the job is the job of the National Library. So the job of the National Library in general, and also the one of Sweden, is to collect, preserve, and give access to almost everything that is published in in Sweden or whichever country. In Sweden. Um, it stems from a legal deposit act from 1661 that required all printers to deliver one copy to KB. And in reality, this was a censorship law that uh, now luckily helps to preserve Sweden's cultural heritage. So yay for censorship. Um, this law was expanded in uh, the 1900s to include sound, moving images, and also video games. So we have a lot of physical um data currently the collections hold over 18 million items which is mostly physical but we are uh, digitizing a lot of this data in order to well to do for example statistical research with it and this is where we come in so kb lab was started in 2019 to give researchers the possibility to do large scale quantitative research. For example, you are a linguist and you want to, to study uh, the, the usage of um, words, for example, for handicapped people, how the word has changed over the last 50 years in the newspapers. And before you would have to, to go to the library to look at all the newspapers and just read a lot of newspapers, physical newspapers. And um, now with digitized newspapers and with the data that we curate, uh, you can use statistical methods. So make your life much easier and do larger scale research. With this data ourselves, we also train models um, that we then publish completely freely for anyone to use to do anything with them. So for academia, governmental organizations, but also the industry. And this is one of our, our main goals when we train models that anybody should be able to use them no restrictions so what is a language model um, when i was young a language model used to be a frequency based engram model so you just count uh, how many times uh, uh, some words appeared in a context with another word and you would use that to then predict the next word in the sentence and you would use that and for example uh, when you stitch together uh, a translation using an old machine translation system. You use the language model to to test if your stitched together translation was actually resembling um, the target language. Nowadays, language models are more or less exclusively transformer-based self-trained models, or more or less base models, and they are self-trained. We call um since they're not really supervised they're not really unsupervised and they are trained by predicting missing words either missing words in the middle of a sentence or missing words at the end of the sentence and the coolest thing with those is that they are trained once and fine-tuned often and uh, the most popular one of those is still nowadays bird um the bird model and it can be used for a lot of applications so you train it once and then you can uh, fine-tune it for your personal application quite easily. What is a large language model? 
Um, that is a bit difficult to say. So uh, when BERT was published in 2018, they published a large version, which was 340 million parameters. And then this number grew more and more. So in 2019, OpenAI published their GPT-2 model, which was then one and a half billion. Uh, NVIDIA um, developed the Megatron LM framework, which is basically the basis for most um, language model training frameworks nowadays still with 8.3 billion parameters then. And then OpenAI came again with GPT-3 and completely blew the competition out of the water with 100, 175 billion parameters. And then we have had some some even bigger models like with Microsoft and NVIDIA, 530 billion. But generally anything, everything that is more than 1 billion parameters is considered a large language model. So what do we need to train a large language model? Well, first we need a lot of data and then also a lot of compute. So this is gonna be expensive. Uh, compute, the National Library has some in-house compute for fine tuning or training smaller models. But for training a large model, uh, this is not enough. And for that, we were awarded 5 million core hours on Meluxina. I read the other day that we uh, were awarded uh, 10 million GPU hours, um, which is would, be, would have been a dream. But 5 million core hours are around 320,000 uh, GPU hours, so quite a bit less. <coughs> we then chose Meluxina for our regular access because it was the, um, I think then the, the biggest NVIDIA system or NVIDIA cluster that we could use. It's located in Luxembourg and has 200 GPU nodes with each four GPUs and 40 gigabytes of memory. So it's reasonably big, should be enough for our, our needs. So how much compute do you need to train a large language model? And here you can see the, uh, the number of nodes that would be used in the training on the x-axis and the time that it needs to, to train the model. And using all the compute for the whole year, we would have been able to train one 15 billion uh, parameter model by train by using all of Meluxina one day every month. Um, that wouldn't have been the best use of our time and a little bit risky. So if we were to use um, less training data, we could have trained bigger models or more models, um, but then we would have trained suboptimal models. So that's not so good either. So we cleaned all of our training data as much as possible to, to get rid of, uh, well, unclean data <coughs> and decided to instead uh, go for less training data. And um, yes, I will tell more about that. Um, for data, the National Library, as I said, has a lot of data, but not everything is um, digitized. So we have newspapers that need to be digitized, and then we need to do some um, object character recognition to well, get to the text. We have a lot of parliamentary proceedings, Swedish government official reports, and our own web crawl. We combine that with um, some prepared web corpora, uh, like the MC4 corpus from Google, Oscar and the pile, which are mostly based on uh, common crawl, Wikipedia and some other. <coughs> Sorry. Um, when you train a large language model, step one is to clean the data, which for the newspaper means you get rid of all the OCR mistakes, you get rid of duplicate documents, um, like you can have the same text multiple times all over the web or even um, in multiple newspapers. We wanted to get rid of non-Swedish data, non-text, which is especially a problem on the web, a lot of HTML that suddenly jumps through. And we wanted to anonymize to a certain degree. Our original goals were to train a 20 billion parameter GPT model to be able to, train, to generate beautiful Swedish text and some smaller models of different types. But as I showed earlier, the with the core hours that we had, this wouldn't have been quite possible. So instead, we <clears throat> um, continued training existing models, and there I say fully open models, meaning that those models can be used by anyone as well. <coughs> For example, the Llama 2 model by Facebook 
uh, is not really allowed to be used um, by governmental agencies or um, the industry without uh, having to pay. So those are out of the question of us. So we decided instead for a 20 billion <coughs> GPT model <coughs> um, and uh, 7 billion and 3 billion Llama style models by somebody else. And then we also plan to train some adapters for the Falcon models, which are completely open. And then we want to, again, publish those models with the same open licenses. And I will be happy to answer any questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Robin. You were exactly precise on time. <laughs> and yes, please, uh, if there are any questions, please type in the chat. And with that, I would like to invite our third uh, success story speaker, Jonas Fers Lotz. Jonas, uh, can you enable your camera and microphone? Yep. You see me okay. and hear me all right? Yes. And um, Jonas is a PhD student from University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And uh, well, the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes as well. Now we see the slides. Yeah. You should see language modeling with pixels. Yes, we see it. Thank oh. you. OK, and it is skipping slides automatically. OK, perfect. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yes, my name is Jonas Lotz. I am a PhD student at the University of Copenhagen, the Department of Computer Science. More specifically, I am working in the field of natural language processing. Uh, focusing on language modeling with pixels. I will be presenting uh, several pieces of work uh, that are all or have all been run or trained using a Kaolina Euro HPC grant, um, which would so this work would not have been possible without this uh, hardware funding. I mean, we just heard about language models, but uh, Maybe some of you have joined since, so just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, what is a language model? Um, I think it can be helpful in these days to simply think of a language model as a word prediction model. So, for example, in this example here with the woman drew many famous, a language model would take in this input do some calculations and then output a prediction score for what is likely to be the next word. The next word uh, could also it could also be uh, the middle of the word if we're doing mass language modeling, but it could also be the next word in the sentence. If our model is a deep neural network and has billions and billions of features, um, then we say it's a large language model. And a bit more formally, how do we compute uh, the next word? So the probability of a next word is simply given as this um, predicted score. And we then sort of search over our entire vocabulary of words. <clears throat> so where might we encounter a large language model? Examples include spelling and grammar checking machine translation, web search, text prediction, topic modeling, chatbots. Uh, there could also be uh, voice assistants, so Alexa or Siri. So most of us probably uh, interact with a large language model on a daily basis. Yes, so the state of NLP today, natural language processing, the economist uh, a year ago had an article featuring this figure here on the left titled the blessings of scale. Um, it shows how the size of language models or um, AI models more in general, you have drawing language vision and other types of models. They have dramatically increased in size over the past 10 years. On the right side, you have here um, a figure from Wei and colleagues showing that not only have the models increased in size. We also see that the models become better with, si with size and some tasks can only per be performed after a certain um, model size. 
this can be referred to as emergent abilities. So after a certain size, um, certain abilities emerge. So as I said, I am a PhD student at the University of Copenhagen working in natural language processing. What can I do when I don't have big tech resources um, to run my models on or with? The, the answer to that question we thought would be to research into NLP for all written languages. The reason being that there are 7,000 spoken languages of which 3,000 of them are written. We have globally at least 400 languages with more than a million speakers. But in NLP today, um, sorry, sort of the state, uh, the NLP models, they only cover around 100 languages. Um, so we are leaving roughly 300 languages, written languages behind, uh, which, is, which is a serious um, lack of technological inclusion for billions of people. So, for example, uh, the graph on the left here, we have the, the number of languages and the number of speakers. So here in Denmark, um, we might be sort of here on the curve uh, for the Faroese. They might be somewhere here on the curve. And, and, and then you see over here, well, but the very, very big languages like uh, the Latin based or Han with more than one billion, well, there are very few of those languages. Um, so, but the idea is sort of that no matter what language you speak, you shouldn't be left behind um, in this technological development simply because you don't speak a high resource language. So we propose this idea of pixel based language modeling where the key idea or the key insight is that we should treat language as um, an image um, instead of how we would typically do. So here we have the more traditional NLP pipeline where for a raw text, we would normalize it, tokenize it, have an embedding lookup function, and then we could finally model the data. Uh, to go a bit more into detail, for those of you who might not be from the NLP field, the normalization step uh, could simply be to separate out punctuation um, so these are more sort of handcrafted rules to make the data more easier to work with. After normalization, we would have a tokenization step. Um, it is um, perhaps the most tricky step in the LP pipeline. So here we see that for our example, Kierkegaard was a golden age philosopher. The word Kierkegaard is split into three, what we call subwords, um, whereas the word philosopher is kept as a full word. This is because when we trained or created our vocabulary for this particular language model, uh, the word philosopher occurred frequently enough to be sort of in the vocabulary, whereas Kierkegaard was not seen or not seen frequently enough. So it's split into two subwords. Um, so, and this has a lot of um, downsides to, to, to be direct. So what we propose is we simply skip a lot of this pipeline, we render the text as an image, and then we can jump straight to the modeling step. Um, so for the same example, Søren Kierkegaard was a golden age philosopher. We can render that as an image of text that has the nice properties that we don't have to do in, in normalization. We don't have a tokenization step. Uh, and if we suddenly don't want to model English anymore and swap to a complete different script, well, we then just render um, scripts instead because, well, now language is being represented by pixel values, uh, which we can just turn on and off. So we propose this new type of generative language model. It's a model that is trained with uh, a reconstruction task. So it's it's a mask, mask language model, if you will. Um, the task is to reconstruct the pixels of the text that has been masked. So just for a quick example here, you see we train the model for 1 million time steps, uh, our training steps. And over the process of training, the model gets better. Um, 
In some cases, it figures out what is the correct text to put here. So this is an example that's not seen during training. It's only seen at test time. Uh, so we're just comparing the performance at different training steps. Uh, of course, there are also cases where the model simply does not manage to figure out what it should put there. The nice thing about this, so if we were to evaluate the performance of our model named Pixel uh, and compare it to, for example, BERT, which we just heard about, is a very still a very popular language model, we see that for especially languages where um, BERT does not have this script in its vocabulary, we largely outperform BERT because, well, we never run into a out of vocabulary problem with Pixel. So further experiments that we ran, we proposed the idea that maybe we could have a step that would, um, instead of a continuous rendering strategy, we would split it into uh, bigrams uh, to decrease the size of the set of unique patches that the model sees during training. So instead of seeing a large number of almost identical patches for similar text inputs, it now sees a smaller set. This is very nice. Uh, because it allows the model to, to better learn um, sort of a hidden state representation of the text. So we see here now on named entity recognition in African languages, comparing BERT, Canine, which is a, a recent character, uh, 2001, 2021, uh, character-based language model. We have a pixel and we have our pixel operating over bigrams. Uh, we see that bigrams in all cases outperforms uh, the previous model, including Kenin, and here for Amharic, for example, where BERT uh, has a vocabulary coverage of zero, it just gets a, a score of zero here. So it's not missing, it's just scoring zero. Some additional research that we're doing is that um, since this language model is operating over visual representations, well, we can pre-train the model on any kind of data that we can visually represent, which is a lot of different data. Um, so we are sort of asking ourselves, well, what kind of data does the model need to see during pre-training? Uh, and we have this access of, uh, on one hand, we have natural language data, which has a, a certain degree of grammar. And then on the other end, we would have, for example, naturally occurring images which have no linguistic grammar and then sort of in this space we can vary what kind of data the model needs to see um, because maybe we don't need to pre-train on natural language um, which would then make the model uh, perhaps more robust when we want to transfer from so right now we're doing um, in the base setting of pixel we're doing english only pre-training and then transferring during fine-tuning time to a specific downstream language, uh, but maybe we could um, do a more unified pre-training that is not language specific. Um, so yeah, our ongoing experiments suggest that pre-training on natural language is very important, uh, which is perhaps not super surprising, but still nice to confirm. This slide is just to, to make uh, or to repeat that this kind of research would not have been possible to do by us if it was not for the Euro HPC grants. Uh, not only were we able to develop these models, but we were also able to do fur like further uh, development and research on them. So we've been able to, for example, bring down the compute uh, to pre-train. So in the first base case, it took eight days to pre-train. Now it only takes two days. Um, we have a list of ongoing work. So for example, in the language space, we'd like to improve sentence level reasoning tasks, we'd like to scale some multilingual pre-training. Uh, we also have work looking into understanding how this cross script transfer uh, works. And yes, I think I'm running a bit out of time here, uh, but just the conclusion. So this line of work renders text as images instead of having a tokenization step. Uh, this avoids a fixed finite vocabulary and what we call the vocabulary bottleneck. Um, it's nice because now high resource and low resource languages are processed equally. Again, high resource languages are like English and Han, um, Chinese, and low resource languages are languages where there are simply not a lot of data available. Pixel-based models are excellent on robustness tasks. 
because now it's just looking at visual representations of texts. Um, so they are efficient language learners. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And just a note, which system did you use? Uh, Carolina, for all of it. Okay, Carolina in Czech Republic. Okay, thank you very much, Jonas. And as we are running out of time, Jonas, again, if there are questions, please uh, type in the chat and Jonas will answer them. And we go forward with our yep. next presentation. So next one is uh, Daniel Opalka from EuroHPC Joint Undertaking, who is the head of the research and innovation sector. And Daniel will talk about research and innovation project opportunities for AI. And Daniel, the floor is yours. You're welcome to share. So good morning, everybody. I hope you you're able to see the title yeah. slide, uh, which yes. state research and innovation opportunities. Uh, so in this presentation, I would like to provide uh, you with a little bit of information on our activities in the field of research, uh, which we mostly implement via grants, and also, of course, uh, point to some very recent actions in the area of artificial intelligence. So, as has been explained earlier today, we are, as the joint undertaking, an organization that is has different public and private partners. So our major stakeholder is the European Union, uh, represented by the European Commission, uh, that contributes about almost 50% of the overall funds that we are able to spend on our operations, including infrastructure, as well as research and innovation. Now, most of our most of our actions, most of our grants follow a co-funding scheme, which means that a part of the grant is covered by the European Union, by the Euro HPC joint undertaking as the implementing body. And about typically 50%, sometimes more of this of this part of this grant have to be contributed by the individual participating states of the UHPC joint undertaking, as well as so-called so in-kind contribution from our private members. Now, our private members are the three industry associations, Big Data Value Association, the European Quantum Industry Consortium, and the European Technology Platform for High Performance Computing. So what you can see here in red is roughly uh, the areas of activities uh, that belong that are implemented by the research and innovation part of our operations unit, uh, and we have about a budget of two billion euro to spend on these activities in this multi-annual financial framework. So between 2021 and 2027. Uh, so how? Are we supporting the European communities uh, with this uh, with these funds? And here we have a number of financial instruments at our disposal. We use primarily uh, the the instrument of grants in research and innovation, covering our different pillars of activities, technology, for example, this can be hardware technology, can be system software for high performance computing or in general software stack. We cover applications with grants, typically our initiatives on uh, European centers of excellence for HPC applications is one of the bigger initiatives in this area, skills and usage, where as an example, we support with the grant a European master program for high performance computing and many, many other initiatives as well. And I'll speak a little bit more about our most significant or most visible projects uh, in this later in this presentation. International cooperation just recently started for us. We started with an international cooperation project 
uh, with Japan, that there is more to come. Beyond this, we have the instrument of procurement uh, at our disposal, which is more relevant for our infrastructure activities. So within research and innovation, we use this, however, for the procurement of the European quantum computing infrastructure, which still is at a very early stage and has a, a significant research and innovation component. Beyond this, and not provided by the EURHPC joint undertaking, uh, many of our initiatives are complemented by equity and debt financing, in particular in the area of technology, if you think of chip technology. And here there are a number of other European in European organizations that provide this support, namely the European Innovation Council that provides equity investments and the European Investment Bank offering loans. Uh, one of our ambitions is and to develop the entire HPC value chain in Europe and uh, in order to, so in order to achieve progress towards the uh, the general long term goals in the union to achieve more technology <clears throat> technological autonomy in the union it is very important to evolve the european ecosystem in a reasonably balanced way cover starting from chips for HPC critical components up to the HPC customers and users. Now, if you look at this figure, which is uh, from a study financing the future supercomputing that was that was per uh, performed by the European Investment Bank before the Euro HPC joint undertaking has been established, you can see that there is or at least for those of you who are familiar with the European ecosystem, there is a significant European presence in these examples on the slide, but where we completely miss European presence is in the very left column on chip and critical components. And this is one of the fields where we invest invested significantly. Artificial intelligence obviously is a horizontal topic covering being related to many of these levels in the HPC value chain from specialized chips for training models or inference up to software stack and resource allocation management in HPC centers and finally of course also skills so that this is something that more and more enters the different initiatives in these in these six areas. Uh, r and I in numbers, we currently manage about 500 million uh, euro in in grants for research and innovation. We probably get we will get closer to one billion of commitments uh, by the end of this year, and those are primarily invested in large projects, as you can see. The distribution of of budget between projects about sixty percent uh, is allocated to large projects. This is on purpose, as uh, one of the one of the ideas of the EURHPC joint undertaking is to pool with European resources to be able to fund such large strategic projects in the union. And here we focused on a number of areas, HPC hardware, including advanced processes, accelerators, high bandwidth interconnect technology, a software stack, including programming models, resource management software, HPC services, applications in the scientific areas, and of course, skills, usage, and HPC adoption. Uh, a few, a, here's a, a selection of projects that focus or include significant industry participation. I explained just before that we also have three private members in the EuroHPC joint undertaking and their 
these the members of these industry associations are of course always invited to participate in our research grants and our open calls for proposals so here are for examples certainly two of them with a significant ai potential or component uh, legate um, drug discovery and drug design across as the hpc big data artificial intelligence cost that platform towards exascale and two more two projects uh, with a more traditional simulation focus next sim and exa form so these are typical opportunities to participate in our funding programs through open calls that we launch on a regular basis a few words on the procedure how what happens after a participant or a consortium of participants submits a proposal so this to, after the call deadline the Euro HPC joint undertaking will carry out an evaluation of all the proposals that have been submitted in this call. There are different steps in this evaluation procedure. There's, it starts with an admissibility check, eligibility check, and then different phases of evaluations, always under participation of independent external experts. And this takes typically one or two months until the expert evaluation has concluded and is followed by a more formal procedure where we pre present the results of the evaluation to the Euro HPC governing board. And then this governing board uh, discusses and decides on this on the ranked list which is ultimately the funding decision and allows us as the joint undertaking to initiate the grant agreement preparation phase with the successful consortia. So this whole process takes about five months. So this is indicative, of course, it depends always on the call on the project. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's less. And by the end of this process, we inform all the beneficiaries through an evaluation summary report and those that were successful will receive an invitation to prepare a grant agreement with the Euro HPC joint undertaking. Uh, following this, we typically need about three months for this grant agreement preparation phase until the, the grant signature. This is, it starts all with a submission of all relevant project related data by the consortium, which takes to usually already six weeks of, all, uh, of this period. And then negotiation or discussions with the Euro HPC joint undertaking to prepare the contract agreement. Now, beyond these call by call projects that we offer, we also have ongoing projects that provide more continuous support for the communities. And this is in a way all aligned with the broader European strategy on the digital compass, which one of the proposed ambitions uh, set, set out is that about 75% of European enterprises have taken up cloud computing services, big data, and specifically artificial intelligence. And more than 90% of European SMEs reach at least the basic level of digital. The knowledge. So here I would just want to mention three of the projects. This is one of them is the pan-European network of European competence centers in high performance computing. A second initiative on the financials and financial support for HPC uptake by small and medium-sized enterprises. <clears throat> Much of these activities involve artificial intelligence and uh, talent development within our European master program for high performance computing. The perhaps the largest project in this area of 
community support that we are currently managing is the Euro CC network, which is a network of more than 30 national competence centers to widen use of HPC in Europe. Those are set up to provide specific local support to small and medium sized enterprises, but also to a certain extent to the wider community in the respective country. Almost every country in Europe has in the meantime such a center that helps stakeholders to benefit from advanced HPC services in a number of areas and also in particular in the adoption of HPC to address, for example, business problem in artificial intelligence. Coming to more direct financial support uh, to communities and here uh, to small and medium sized enterprises, one of our projects that is already ongoing for several years that provides to a very significant part uh, support for artificial intelligence is the FF4Euro HPC project. This is already the third generation, the third phase of a sequence of projects under the name Fortissimo, where the, a consortium funded by Euro HPC provides financial support to small and medium sized enterprises to solve business problems and also support through expertise from leading European HPC centers. And these projects cover a wide range of applications. So I'd, here at the very top, you can see, for instance, the a, pro a picture from a project to, uh, to manage poultry farms to address the health and detect health status of chicken in, in such a farm using artificial intelligence. This year, we are going to continue uh, this, this quite successful project on small and medium sized enterprises with a uh, call on supporting competitiveness and innovation potential of SMEs. We have significantly extended the scope of this project. There will be in the next three years, three calls for proposals where small and medium sized enterprises can put forward their business case and have a chance to get awarded funding to adopt HPC for their challenges. These, this call addresses two topics. The first is a continuation of the preceding phases of this project, addressing more general the HPC uptake of by SMEs. And uh, what is new now is a specific track on the adoption of large scale HPC resources for the development of generative AI models. So this is specific to SMEs that have an existing business model around generative AI and will benefit from large scale HPC resources and the adoption of HPC, for example, in training those models. So in this case, in SMEs are eligible to up to 600,000 euro financial support. And in combination with our standard access schemes to our HPC systems, we believe this will be significant support for the field in the European Union. Now, in my last slide, uh, I will give you a little bit of an outlook or look a little bit into the future on RNI opportunities and community support in artificial intelligence. So we are currently planning our activities for the next for the coming years and in particular for 2024. And in this regard, we are currently discussing a number of ideas that could 
support the AI communities in Europe. One of them, for instance, to support pooling and consolidation efforts by the communities to develop more competitive AI enabled by HPC. The adaptation and tuning of an AI software stack that can be used efficiently on Euro HPC supercomputers with their diverse system architectures, facilitate the development and deployment of HPC ready software, perhaps including some pre-trained models that can be used by the communities to develop more specialized models with significantly saving resources, as well as overall to develop the community and contribute to HPC related training in artificial intelligence. So it is, thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Daniel. And as usual, you're welcome to type your questions in the chat and Daniel will answer them as well. And the next presentation is actually mine uh, and I will try to share my screen. We're running a bit late, so I will try to be as fast as I can. Let's see if it works. Okay. So I will not I will not go through some of my slides as my colleagues have already presented uh, the information. And as you know, already the systems have detailed uh, quite a lot and our smaller systems, comparable smaller beta scale systems have also been touched and success stories were shown at these systems. But what I would like to emphasize is, especially for AI communities, the GPUs are the most important part of the systems. And if we look at the calls we're launching, there is enormous amount of resources available for you to use. So uh, the resources published are in node hours, which means number of nodes times number of cores per node. And every system has its number of nodes, but in total we have 365 um, uh, GPUs. And uh, the calls are um, for different flavors and they will be also adjusted in, accord uh, in accordance with what Vangelis said that we would like to adjust these types of calls so that they will be more uh, visible for AI communities to, to, to apply. But uh, for now, we would like to emphasize that by using the uh, benchmark and development access possibility, you will have the chance to test and develop uh, your training models and then uh, at the end apply for regular or XTM access, which is enormous amount of uh, a time, 7.7 .7 million uh, node hours that are available to apply for and access is for uh, two years or one year. You can find a lot of information about the systems themselves, about their memory per uh, node and uh, uh, all the details about the interconnectivity at the websites of our hosting entities. And uh, also you can be directed to these websites through our EuroHPC homepage. Additionally, for this access uh, types, uh, Vangelis already detailed who can apply, but just to emphasize the staircase. So start with benchmark, go to development, and then finally apply for regular and extreme access calls. That will be the most natural way to proceed. Um, here is our homepage where you have all the calls published and updated periodically. We also started to publish the awarded projects uh, and there will be more uh, additions to this. Uh, we also here published the calls that Daniel mentioned uh, for research and innovation uh, activities. And for the access, if you have difficulty to use the forms uh, to apply, uh, the National Competence Center of Sweden and CCS have uh, created a very nice video where you go step by step how to fill in these forms and where to write, where to type what. And finally, if you still have questions, you are always welcome to contact us uh, and you have the contacting possibilities on our website as well. Now about AI applications on our systems. As of August 2023, 
we had the uh, following uh, applications on, on, on our system. So 90 active AI projects are uh, running on our systems as we speak. And you see here the distribution per system. There are also additionally 30 uh, applications uh, for projects in AI being evaluated right now. And uh, hopefully the results will be known uh, in a month or so, then we can uh, update these statistics. Out of this total 119 projects, 42 are large language model applications. So it's interesting to see this tendency as well. And you can see that there are already several uh, AI applications that have applied for regular and access uh, and extreme access. Uh, and these are the projects that went through the benchmark and development calls and used the, res the small resources first. As uh, Daniel mentioned, there are over 30 national competence centers across the whole Europe financed by EuroHPC joint undertaking that are established to help you to use our resources or to adjust your models. And these are, every European country has one. So you're always welcome to contact them. And they have been also working quite tightly with different AI projects within their countries. Except that we have the hosting entities and the hosting entities themselves have also HPC experts that are aside from helping on every day using the systems, they also do a lot of AI directed projects with different uh, applicants. So if we look at the statistics a little bit, uh, right now our hosting entities are um, have uh, over around 200 projects, uh, AI projects uh, that are not really the connected to EuroHPC joint undertaking, but are on national level. And if we look at the uh, software that are installed on the systems, then you can find a whole uh, a list of uh, AI software stack that is being used on these systems starting from PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras, Netcat, and so on, to finishing with Megatron. Uh, all this uh, accumulated software, of course, based on the type of architecture, but you will definitely find uh, some of these that are relevant for your research. Except that our hosting entities are also organizing different training towards IE, starting from fundamentals of deep learning, going to more advanced trainings and uh, um, seasonal schools that are being organized uh, around AI. You can find uh, all this information on the websites of our hosting entities and you can be directed to this through our own home uh, website. Um, the National Competence Centers themselves, as I said, are also working with AI projects and you can see here the distribution between the projects that are uh, in collaboration with small and medium enterprises or public sector or academia at their own countries. And you see the distribution, for example, in Finland, there are projects running with SMEs. In Sweden, the majority of the projects are in uh, co collaboration with public sector. Um, the training EuroCC uh, National competence centers are organizing enormous amount of training and there is a dedicated website EuroCC Access where you can find all the lists of training. This training are free of charge, just register and participate and you can find a whole flavor of every possible aspect tackled both for industry, for academia, for public sector, from elementary um, level to, to advanced level. So I would uh, strongly suggest that if you feel like you want to deepen your knowledge in deep learning or any other containerized solutions or, or other tools uh, for AI, just go to this website, find your training, register and participate. Here are a few examples of uh, also success stories on our systems. We have heard three of them presented by the PIs themselves, but uh, here I would just wanted to pick a couple of uh, more success stories uh, that have used our systems. For example, um, a group of researchers from University of Vienna in Austria wanted to be able to uh, sort and classify the glass beds that are found um, that were graved as goods in early uh, middle age 
and they are so many and so many pieces that it's impossible to do by hand and it's a lot of work. So they uh, developed a method that could classify these uh, glass beds and this they did on the Meluxina system of Euro HPC joint undertaking. Another uh, success story is, uh, is the poverty mitigation uh, strategies that was done on the Carolina system in Czech Republic. So a research group from University of Gothenburg in Sweden uh, wanted to better understand the distribution of global poverty historically and geographically. And for that, they trained a deep learning method to predict health and living conditions using satellite images. And again, this was a very successful uh, project that uh, further going to tackle many global challenges. Another interesting case is when um, national uh, governmental organization, National Archives of Sweden, have used the Viga system in Slovenia to uh, analyze the old uh, data. Uh, that was actually on paper. So they had first to create the images and then uh, run their models. And uh, in the beginning, we were quite amazed that National Archives were capable to do this uh, training in Slovenia, considering the question of uh, uh, security and, and so. But but they were successful and they managed to, to get their projects and uh, um, go over the hinders of security and and run this quite well. They are actually having now uh, two more projects running in this direction on Euro HPC systems. And with that, I would like to thank you. I have tried to be as fast as possible to manage on time. And uh, I would like to ask you to pose your questions in the chat if you have any. I see there are several uh, questions. Uh, Daniel have answered. Okay, and uh, with my uh, with my presentation, we're uh, we're ended uh, towards the question and answer session and the break. We are running late actually, and that is why uh, I would like to ask you to pause your questions, or otherwise, if you want to ask, raise your hand and ask. And uh, I would like to keep this session only five minutes to manage on time with the event. So, and if not, we can use this five minutes as a break and continue at 55 past 11. So break or question answer period until 55 past 11.
Okay, then I guess we start. I hope everyone is back from the break. As our next speaker is my colleague Clara Mastrovic, who will be presenting about uh, how to utilize Euro HPC joint undertaking systems. So, Clara, test if you can share. Yes, yes I will share. Mm -hmm. Can I do uh -huh. PowerPoint live? Would this be the best option or? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Thank you. OK, so good day to everyone. My name is Clara Mestrovic, and I am working at the EuroHPCJU as a program manager for peer review under the infrastructure uh, sector. And basically, my job, together with my colleagues that are in the same peer review team, is to manage and um, implement somehow these calls for access and the peer review process behind it. So just like the beginning uh, of the idea in general, why we have and why we do what we do. So basically, why do we even have this peer review process is basically to, since we have all of these resources that we want to give to, to people to utilize them in a proper way, um, we want to make sure, of course, that the um, access to the systems is fair. So this is why we have a peer review process, and I will go into more detail in general what, um, what each call entails. Um, but in general, just to have an idea why we, why we do what we do is in order to be transparent and fair to all the applicants. So without further ado, we start with, uh, with our calls. Uh, they have already been mentioned uh, throughout this event. So the current calls for applications is um, basically a benchmark access call, uh, development access call, and then afterwards we also have regular access and extreme scale access modes. Basically, as also mentioned before, somehow with the benchmark and development, the natural life cycle would be to, to after testing and developing certain aspects, uh, to, to apply to, to big calls like regular access and extreme scale access. So um, with regard to some details, benchmark and development. So benchmark access is intended for scaling tests and benchmarks, and allocation duration is either two or three months. Uh, while the development access can be six to 12 months of allocation and is intended for uh, development of codes and algorithms. Um, eligibility, as also mentioned before, um, this is highlighted in every slide for these calls, um, and I put it like sim simple. Uh, if if the um, team member or uh, PI is uh, the affiliation is not listed on the Horizon 2020 general participation, uh, they cannot apply. So basically, um, we accept the team members and PIs from affiliations connected to the Horizon 2020. So uh, these are continuously open calls for monthly cutoffs with monthly cutoffs, uh, and we have predefined resources available per, 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 per partition. So basically, you cannot request resources that you would like in case of benchmark in development. Uh, this is predefined and is also available on our website. Um, so the process is very simple. It has, let's say it has peer review um, as a simpler peer review. Uh, so proposal submission, of course, uh, then afterwards we have an administrative check, which is done within the office. This then, then later proceeds to the technical assessment. And uh, if the technical assessment is successful, you will get access to the systems. Um, regular access is, um, the next call that it's going to be described. So it's intended for projects that require large scale HPC resources and the peer review process uh, takes around four months. The eligibility again, the same. Uh, this is a continuously open call with three cutoff dates per year. Uh, this is in March, July and November. And the next cutoff date is now in November on the third. Um, of course, we have available resources, and this is on both petascale and pre-exascale systems. 
And now we proceed. So the peer review process is a bit more complicated than for the benchmark and development. Um, so we start with the proposal submission, administrative check executed by the office, the technical assessment done by the HPC centers. Uh, then we have two rapporteurs per proposal that basically write their individual reports. Uh, then we have the domain panel meeting when where proposals are discussed in uh, a domain and ranked within a domain. Uh, then we have the super panel meeting uh, where, where we discuss all of those proposals together and provide a consolidated ranking. Then we have the wrap meeting, which is the resource allocation panel meeting, where we officially allocate the resources according to the produced rank list and recommendations uh, from the super panel meeting. Um, afterwards, we um, this needs to, of course, be approved by the governing board, and uh, then uh, we communicate these results to the applicants. And uh, yes, then the applicants can uh, this is a successful applicants can access the systems. Then we have the extreme scale access, which has an even a slightly more complicated process. Uh, so it's intended, of course, for high impact, high gain projects that require extremely large uh, resources. The peer review duration is six months. The eligibility, again, the same. Uh, this is a continuously open call with two cutoff dates per year. And in this case, the next cutoff uh, date is quite soon on 6th of October. Uh, and we offer resources on uh, pre ex scale systems in this case. So the process is the following. So we start from the proposal submission, administrative check, then afterwards the technical assessment, a scientific evaluation done by the uh, three external referees. Uh, then we have a response to review space where the applicants um, are able to reply to any criticism raised by the end of or of course praises um, um, raised by the referees from the scientific evaluation step and of course the technical assessment. Um, afterwards, the two rapporteurs are assigned per proposal and basically they uh, take into consideration the technical assessment, the scientific evaluation and the re responses from the PIs uh, while writing their individual and consolidated reports. So after, afterwards, we have an ARC meetings. This is the Access Resource um, Committee meeting. And basically, here we rank all of the proposals together, and uh, also they provide um, a recommendation per proposal. Afterwards, there is a, a resource allocation panel meeting, which is the, very, it's the same as in regular access, where we officially allocate the resources. And uh, then the governing board approves the results uh, and we communicate the results to the applicants. So in just to have an overview, how a little bit more detail, how, how this actually works and what do you, um, what is somehow required uh, to pass the threshold in case of these evaluations. So, we have three access tracks, um, now speaking about the extreme scale and regular access, um, scientific industry and public administration. As you can see here, we have certain reserves and prioritization per tracks. Um, as also mentioned by Vangelis, he also put that, um, that uh, uh, these calls are open for industry. So of course, you're more than welcome to apply here. And here we have 20% uh, reserve uh, for, for industry in this case, and of course, 5% for public administration. Um, the evaluation criteria uh, in this case, so we are, we are always evaluating excellence, innovation and impact, and quality and efficiency of the implementation. In case of scientific proposals, the guiding criteria is, guiding cr criterion is excellence. Well, for industry and public administration, uh, this is innovation and impact. Uh, the scoring system, so as we reach for the best of the best somehow, um, the grade is zero to five per criterion. Minimum grade per criterion has to be three. And uh, the, overall, uh, the overall grade to pass the threshold has to be minimum 10. 
um, just to have an overview for the timeline from extreme scale and regular access. So this is how it looked uh, from 2021 when the first regular access call was opened in December and we had the first cut of then uh, how it started. So the blue part is the regular access and the, um, uh, the yellow part is, is extreme scale access. This, I, I somehow wanted to represent that you have many opportunities to apply, even in case of some unsuccessful applications or you want to continue work that has been successful. So there are plenty of opportunities to apply to calls, uh, to, well, currently mentioning just these two calls that, that we have. Um, some advices um, that I don't know, I feel that it would be helpful uh, for future applicants and also for the current applicants. So first of all, to study the call documentation. So it may happen that we update some templates. It's good to always before applying, go to the uh, JU's website to check the, um, the templates also for uh, reporting afterwards. Uh, of course, we have uh, let's say recently applied some tech, uh, uploaded some technical guidelines. I believe that it should be very helpful for the applicants to understand the, the system requirements better. And of course, terms of reference in general to have an idea what 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 do we intend, how how the process will go. There are some other documents published there by call, the full call documentation, which describes this process for every call uh, in more detail. So of course. You can always drop a message to us as well, but it's very good to 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 go through these documents to have like a, a big picture of how how the everything works. Of course, the second point that that uh, we wanted to highlight here is to justify uh, the resources requested. This especially highlighting for extreme scale and regular access. This is something that is always looked at um, uh, by by our committee. Uh, whether the resources request is duly justified and, and nicely elaborated in the in the, in the proposal. Um, we would also advise to communicate to, with the hosting entities and uh, with, the, with, with us, with the UHPC staff or any questions. So for hosting entities, any specific technical information that you may require and also for us regarding anything regarding the process, it's uh, important to have all the information before submitting the proposal and after, of course. And um, last but not least here, what we wanted to highlight is to, to take into consideration any feedback given uh, by the Access Resource Committee. Of course, this, um, this point uh, is applicable to those who submitted the proposal, who received some feedback, whether the proposal was successful or not. It's very important to take this feedback into consideration. And uh, in case of unsuccessful projects, to really take it uh, and implement the suggestions uh, provided by the committee into a new proposal. And now, just uh, I will I will try to be as fast as possible, just to go through um, the application forms and documents that, uh, and just quickly how it looks. Um, basically. For the benchmark and development access forms, uh, what the applicants would need to provide is some basic information about the project, title, summary keywords, uh, research fields, duration, of course, uh, information about the principal investigator and team members, and of course, the practitioners that, uh, that the applicants would like to apply. Uh, there are some, of course, technical details that uh, need to be provided and in order for the colleagues from the centers to be able to evaluate the project. And uh, also for code details development and usability, this is especially highlighted for, um, this is in both calls, but it's also more detailed in, in, the, in the development access call. So for, uh, this is just a screenshot from extreme scale access. Uh, it's quite similar uh, with regard to the online forms. Ah, I wanted to also say that for benchmark and development, you don't need to submit um, another document for like a proposal document is not necessary. So just the online forms is the proposal. In case of regular access and extreme scale, we have the online forms plus an, um, a document, a proposal document. 
So in this case, uh, of course, it's the same to provide uh, information about the project and about the um, principal investigator and team members, the partitions, of course, code details and development. Here we also ask some information about the dissemination strategy and collaboration and funding. And also the PIs have the possibility to exclude reviewers in case they find that um, this would be um, some conflict of interest at hand or something, or, and also to suggest uh, evaluators, and this is in case of extreme scale access. Uh, so the project scope and plan, uh, this is, uh, it's quite similar for um, extreme scale and regular access. So the project scope and plan is basically the proposal template. Um, it may currently, it may not be applicable to, to everyone here, but I will just give uh, an overview and it's, I think it, it, for any really technical questions, I think it would be good to, to ask us or to ask the hosting entities for any clarifications needed. The templates are online, so you can study them and see if anything is unclear. Um, so basically here, the detailed proposal information, of course, is required. Um, the resources justification, data management performance of the software, of course, it's not, not everything is listed here. Um, it's also important to uh, present milestones and again chart, of course, the, pro the proposed work workflow. Uh, personnel and management plan as well. So this is just an example, some some uh, scaling um, plots and of course the runs and of course uh, node hours per run that are required to be filled in. So how to apply? Um, this is on the peer review platform available at pre calls. Uh, this is just briefly how it looks. As an applicant, uh, so these are links to log in and to register. And this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. And here you have our emails, so from the full team and our office email for access. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clara, for your presentation. There are some answers in the chat. You are welcome to uh, handle and I think there is even a question for Daniel for the research and information and the innovation part and with that I think we're uh, coming to our last session which are the two more success stories of AI on HPC and these are the projects that have received funding through the FF for Euro HPC uh, call and uh, I would like to invite the first speaker, who is Gabriel Gonzalez, the CTO of Daycom Technologies Spain. Gabriel, Hello. thank you for joining us, despite your. <laughs> yeah, um, COVID. I wanted to first of all say I woke up with a fever and the feeling what is probably COVID uh, might be a, a strong flu. Uh, so if I sound a little bit off, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> I ask for your understanding. No uh, problem and thank you for I joining. Take, I, I, I took enough drugs to at least look decent. So <laughs> I'm okay. here. Uh, can you please try to share your slides? Yes, coming. Okay. Is it okay. there? Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. So you can start. Okay. okay. Um, I'm a CTO of the small company, Decom Technologies, that um, we work with uh, mostly data analysis and uh, data processing and uh, for the industry. We don't do um, final product for customers. We work for bigger industries uh, in the field of the uh, machine learning, data analysis. And I'm going to present a, a success story about uh, a product we developed some years ago and we improved uh, thanks to the HPC uh, grant that we got last year. Um, this was a joint uh, effort of uh, the group of Escanova, which is the biggest uh, fishing and fish growing company in Spain, uh, Decom Technologies, my company, and uh, the HPC provider Sesga. Here in Spain. 
Uh, the challenge, okay. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, we had the idea uh, together with Pescanova of um, trying to make a mathematical model of the growth and everything that's around uh, the fi a fishing farm that they have here. Uh, fish are complicated people. Uh, sorry? Okay, fish are complicated people. They are creatures and they like some things, they don't like some other things. So uh, previously there were some mathematical models of the, of the growth and feeding and temperature, but those were, let's say, static, uh, some curves. You have uh, some uh, uh, curves that uh, only uh, represent the, uh, the Gabriel, 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 keep. Sorry, uh, we have a connection problem. I think if you can just uh, close maybe the screen. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, I might uh, have some internet problem, but I see everything. Okay, now here. it seems to be fine. Okay. Okay, uh, as I was saying, uh, yeah, um, there are many complications in the growth models when they're static because fish uh, don't really want to do what you tell them to do, and there are so many variables. So our idea was to uh, take uh, the mathematical model and uh, take the parameters out, uh, all the parameters that influence the fish, and uh, build some uh, predictive models on the parameters. So keep the uh, keep the the, the curves keep the, the way they were working so that we don't need to change the, 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 the whole farm, but improve the predictions with uh, a lot of uh, data. So what we did is go into the data sets. Everything they had um, done for the last years, the last uh, 12 years or so, was already stored in databases or some older data in Excel uh, spreadsheets and we uh, put it inside our systems and we started to study it. Uh, the goal was, okay, we have some metrics, which are the productivity, the time to market, and then the price. And you have the, the, the feeding, the water, the temperature, the use of um, all the resources that you need in the farm and so on. So we tried to maximize the outputs, minimize the inputs, and we did that with AI, let's say, with uh, machine learning. Uh, well, we're a small company, uh, so the first stage was made a little bit by hand. We have our own internal resources for machine learning, which are just yes, what? Small uh, machines. And um, we trained uh, neural networks and some other little segmentators and uh, other techniques that we learn uh, when we study mathematics. And with a lot of human effort, we try to optimize and we got uh, a, a good product um, with engineers <laughs> turning the numbers and selecting the best parameters. Uh, but HPC came to help in the way that they just let us experiment. So let's say, uh, okay, what if you don't need to restrict yourself to your little hardware and you can just open a little bit more the variables, uh, take other parameters that you just couldn't study because there were too many and it was taking very long. If whenever you do a little change on, on a parameter, you need to train for 10 hours in your internal computer and then uh, upload it, test it and so on, it takes very long. So using HPC, we did a hyperparameter tuning and we introduced new variables, new parameters in all the models, uh, even uh, data from other predictive models like temperature forecasts uh, that uh, were already taken from some, um, let's say, AI, AI uh, process into our model. We created a chain of AI predictions. And uh, well, uh, this is a big industry. It uses a lot of resources. And well, yeah, we we got there. We uh, got uh, very good numbers and we improved both the feeding 
process, uh, taking into account many more parameters, we uh, reduced the amount of food or changed the amount of food slightly so that uh, we get a uh, time to market which is two months shorter than it used to be. We're talking about a fish that from birth to time to market is around two years. We got that down to 22 months, uh, which of course improves. Uh, it takes two months away from all the resource spending for the same type of fish on the same type of market. Uh, that has a, a, a big benefit, benefit in the numbers of the company. Uh, those numbers, uh, well, uh, of course, there are certain metrics. Uh, the seven percent is the the big number here. The others are in particular uh, metrics like uh, the water that you're using, or the energy, or the uh, what you can do if you build a new facility with already what you learned. But the seven percent. Uh, we got in the current farm, uh, well, 7% in a big industry is, of course, a very big number. Uh, and this was uh, just by uh, turning numbers and uh, what we already knew, improving it. Um, first of all, what we learned with this, with this experiment, of course, we're already applying. Uh, there were things that we couldn't try. We tried, they worked. Now, in the next experiment, even if we can't use some uh, very big facility, we already know them, so we're going to use them. Uh, other than that, uh, we learned that sometimes when you get to a certain point, uh, requesting some or using some HPC facility will uh, put on top of what you have uh, a, lit a little more percentage, so to we can offer that to our client clients. Once they see the models work, we can say, okay, yeah, with some little more um with some uh, little more effort we can put a, an additional one percent an additional two percent which is in a big industry is a lot and also um the providers uh, helped because uh we used some techniques in small machines let's say that uh, were very different from the techniques you use when you have 4096 processors uh eating data at the same time and we had to uh, rebuild the data sets and so on. And that was very Gabriel. Um do you do him? Sorry, okay, no. <laughs> it looks okay. like my internet is not the best. I no. couldn't go to the office uh, because I'm sick, so at home. Sorry about that. I don't know if you need me to repeat something. Uh, I think it's it was just at the last second, so I think it's okay. fine. And then we can go forward with our next presenter. And thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, there will come some questions in the chat, so please, if you see related to your presentation, please answer them. And our okay. next speaker is Marian Gusev, a COE of Innovation Dual from North Macedonia. And Marian, you are welcome to share your slides. Uh, Gabriel, will you please stop sharing? Okay, Hi nice. to everybody. Do you see the slides? Yes, now we see it well. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I'm a professor at the university, but I also am CEO of our company, Innovation Doyle. And we uh, uh, had a project, uh, an experiment, which is called Cario HPC, to improve the DL-based arrhythmia classification algorithms and also to simulate real-time heart monitoring of thousands of patients. So this presentation, I will try to keep it in the time frame which were given to everybody or even shorter. So the, what was the objective? What was the challenge we had? We would like to realize a real-time remote heart monitoring center. But the main constraint is that the response should be less than three seconds, not for one patient, but for 
10,000 patients. So we did a large scale demonstration. We made the architecture to do this. Uh, we are using a, a high performance computing environment. And also we improved the existing deep learning algorithms. So as a challenge, uh, we tried uh, to improve our view ECG software, which has uh, a C mark. So it is approved as a medical device in Europe. And we tried to make it much better with uh, accuracy and uh, overall performance. Uh, why? Because we would like to use this software as a self-diagnostic AI-based service. So training, uh, when we calculated if we use our own resources, uh, which is a GPU card uh, and uh, similar computers here, uh, that we will need at least two up to five or maybe more years just to do the initial training. And we need uh, such uh, a support such we get with FF4 uh, for your HPC program. So the solution was to use extensive ECG benchmark databases, which were trained. Uh, initially, we trained only using one database, and now we extended this to 100 times more uh, uh, data in the database for training. And we used this, we trained this on thousands of GPU cores. What were the main outcomes with this training we, we received uh, with the models uh, obtained after this training? We have reduced cost and time to design a solution because uh, initially we would train with one GPU, which we will have here in the, our, uh, our environment. But now we use this, a lot of them on the HP, HPC cluster. And uh, instead of uh, using it just for design one year for to design a solution, we did everything, not just design, but also optimization. Uh, we developed new features and uh, we, we developed the model using uh, new features and increased the performance. We also updated our business strategy and the exploitation partner plan and uh, uh, the impact. Practically, we had a ready-to-market service because now it is fast and more accurate. We reduced the error rate by 50%, which means that the error rate was up to 20%, but now it is less than 10, which is really good for us because most of the customers are now more satisfied with the solution. And we doubled the revenue in the last year, so which we are really proud of. So uh, the overall solution practically increases the efficiency and profit which we aimed in the beginning. Uh, expected social uh, societal impact, if we continue selling this product, we will definitely uh, create new jobs uh, like doctors, salespersons, we will have uh, persons for technical support, but what is our main goal was to improve the overall healthcare because using the variable uh, ECG sensors, we can improve the overall healthcare uh, rather than using the traditional way uh, when patients need to go to a hospital and be monitored while they are in hospital. Uh, we had no direct impact on the environment. And what are the lessons learned? We used 5,000 node hours, and each node consisted of uh, two CPUs and four NVIDIA Tesla M60 cards on each node, which equals to 140,000 HPC core hours. These were done on Yota provider from Croatia. Uh, we trained new AI-based algorithms, improved the classification of heartbeat, uh, ventricular and non-ventricular bits, and also detection of AFib, which is uh, atrial fibrillation, one of the most uh, dangerous arrhythmias found. And we found that uh, FF4 Euro HPC support was precious for us. It leads to longer term benefits uh, for all of us. So thank you for listening to this presentation. I will be happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Marian. Thank you for your presentation. And yes, and with this presentation, we came to the end of this event.
I hope it was useful for our, our audience and I hope uh, you have received more information about our calls. Vangelis, I see your hand. I just wanted to, to, to clap and thank you, Lilith, for organizing this. Thank wrong, you very much. Wrong button. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, I, I hope you enjoy it and I apologize for going over the time. But you are always welcome to contact us and as I said, the recording of this event will be available, slides will be shared. And I would like again to thank all the speakers that agreed to participate today at this event. And uh, we will uh, see the needs and organize similar events in the future as well. So I wish you all a nice day further and see you later, probably. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.